Good morning, friends. I am back at you with another COVID Talks. And in today's episode, we're gonna discuss treatment options for patients who are admitted to the ICU. If we haven't met yet, my name is Bree. I'm a nurse practitioner. I work in various ICU settings here in Georgia, and I do a heck of a lot of treatment of COVID patients. Everybody's asking me, what are we using? What are we using in the hospital to make these people better? So that's gonna be the topic for today. There are two caveats here though. One, what I'm talking about applies only to people who are in the ICU. None of this applies to people who are at home or to people who are in the hospital, but not yet. In, well, some of it is to people who are not yet in the ICU, but most of it is not. This is strictly for ICU level critical illness. Okay, that's the first caveat. The second caveat is this is subject to change, maybe even tomorrow. The, we are so blessed to be living in a time when we have doctors and scientists very rapidly working on conducting clinical trials to get us good evidence on what to do for this. And so quite often we'll do things right now that we think are good and it turns out in a couple weeks or a month that it maybe isn't working so well. So it's all an ever-changing and ever-evolving process which we are perfecting as time goes on. Having said that, here's what we're currently doing. First, it starts with supportive care, right? Um, this is a viral illness. The best thing that can possibly happen is that the body fights it on its own. So sometimes when people are critically ill, all we need to do is offer them supportive care to help the body do what it needs to do. Quite often with this illness, people have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, they get very dehydrated and it affects their blood pressure. So really all we need to do is give them some IV fluids back. So we sometimes do that if there's that piece of it. On the flip side of that, when there's lung involvement and the primary issue is severe hypoxemia, we have to get excess fluid off of the lungs and we diurese them. So one of the first supportive things we do is assess the fluid balance and get, either give more or take some away based on what we're seeing. The second thing that we do supportive care wise is supplemental oxygen. So starting in the hospital, if they're not yet in an ICU, we'll put in uh, nasal cannulas, just the prongs that go here in your nose and it can go up to like six liters. Um, it can go a little bit higher and I'll get into some of that in just a little bit. Quite often people just need a little extra boost of oxygen. Overall, people who have this virus with uh, primary effects on the lung do very, very well with low oxygen levels. So we have to kind of judge how much oxygen support we need to give that person. And it's an escalating scale. Another thing that we do that I would consider supportive is IV vitamins. Vitamin C, zinc, um, some people will give vitamin D. Another thing that I tend to do is that people who have a copious amount of coughing, they're constantly coughing, 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 coughing and the coughing tends to drop their oxygen level is that I will just give them a cough suppressant. Now you have to judge this because sometimes when you suppress a cough and there's a lot of junk in there that needs to come up, it can make it worse. But if it's a dry cough and it's just dropping their sats a lot, put them on a cough suppressant and it will help mitigate that a little bit. That's kind of more of a supportive thing. It's not doing anything to fix the virus, but it's helping some of the symptoms. We often ask people to prone themselves, even people in the ICU. Um, you can do this before they're intubated or after they're intubated, but before they've gotten to the point where they need to have the ventilator placed on them, we can increase the amount of oxygen in their nose, reduce the amount of coughing that they're doing, and ask them to flip over onto their belly and just sleep that way for a certain number of hours during the day. What this does is it shunts the blood flow, gravity shunts the blood flow to the areas of the lungs that are not filled up with gunk. So they are actively participating in gas exchange and you almost always can increase the oxygen level that you're getting into the bloodstream by doing this. Now, the downside to it is when they flip back over onto their back, they kind of tend to de-recruit or go back to the way they were. But the goal is that they don't get as low down as they were before, okay? Now, what I wanna say about proning is this. If you are at home, and your oxygen levels aren't low, sleeping on your belly is not gonna help you at all. In fact, it, if you have trouble sleeping on your belly, it may worsen things because you're gonna be exhausted and fatigued and your body's not gonna be able to fight off illness as well. So proning is really only for people who have the pulmonary effects and the low oxygen effects. So maybe it'll help you at home if your oxygen, if your SATs, if you have a home probe and your SATs are below 90, they're in the mid 80s, Okay, try proning a little bit before you come to the hospital. Okay, now moving past the supportive care and getting to active treatments. All of this is highly controversial about whether or not it actually works or does not. So I'm just gonna go through again what we're doing currently.
Remdesivir is an antiviral. We have a study called the ACT trial, which shows that similar like Tamiflu folks, this antiviral can shorten the duration of the illness, but doesn't necessarily affect mortality. So we use it, but does it really help or not? Maybe, so we tend to use it. Part of the problem with this virus is that the immune system overreacts and it like ramps itself up to kill this virus off and then it can't turn itself off. And then it starts like hurting parts of your body that it's not supposed to hurt. The number one medication that I think has the best evidence for reduction in mortality are IV steroids. So there was a trial done called the recovery trial in which a reduction in mortality was demonstrated. So this probably has the best benefit. Um, what that means is that the medication itself is reducing the amount of people who die from this illness. It's kind of small, but it's statistically significant and does show a benefit. So we give IV steroids to people when they're sick enough to require the ICU. You have to judge whether or not IV steroids are right for people when they're not sick enough that they're requiring huge amounts of oxygen support because steroids, while they help the lung aeration, they also suppress the immune system, which is what you need to fight off the virus. So again, it's sort of a, you really, it's a judgment call. Um, we just follow the evidence that we have. And right now, if you need high amounts of oxygen or ICU, you get steroids. Another immune system suppressor is um, a class of medications called monoclonal antibodies. The one that we tend to use is tocilizumab or Actemra. We give a one-time dose of it and it may suppress the overdrive of the body. So the tocilizumab can kind of tamp that down. Um, the, the trick is always when to use it and how to use it. Other treatment options that I think have less evidence, but that are things that some people will opt to do, are strategies to reset and change our immune system. So this gets a little heavy. Let me try and break it down in a way that makes sense. But we will sometimes do a procedure called plasmapheresis. It's very similar to dialysis, but the plasma, the part of the bloodstream that the antibodies live in, is taken out of the body rinsed and given back. And the toxins that develop in a phase called cytokine storm, when the body's producing all of these um, proteins and things that are designed to target the viruses, but are actually overwhelming the body. So IL-6 is an example of this. Um, so plasmapheresis kind of removes that from the body. The sort of flip side of this strategy is to give people donor plasma, so convalescent plasma, people who have had the virus and who have recovered and who have developed antibodies targeted to the virus is donated, that person donates that plasma and that plasma is then given to a sick person in the hopes that they will you know, uptake these antibodies, which will then allow them to fight off the virus. I see this therapy being instituted more often. Does it work? Again, I don't know. And then the last thing that gets super complicated are ventilator strategy. So what I want you to know is that mortality goes up when you go on a ventilator. But here's the really important piece of this, y'all. Mortality is going up because you are just that sick. It's not necessarily because you're on a ventilator. It's because your body is that sick that you're requiring that much support that you have high risk of dying from the virus. So we put people on ventilators, we put them, there are multiple, it's not usually an on off switch. There are like five different variables and they can go up and they can go down. Sometimes people require maximum amount of support from the ventilator. And then we have to use alternative modes of ventilation that are very um, high level of support. One, of, one that we use quite frequently is called APRV. It's super complicated, I'm not gonna get into it, but it's like, the Mac Daddy, like when you're requiring that much ventilator support, you are very, very sick. And never in my career have I ever seen people requiring APRV and proning or flipping onto their belly, and we've been routinely doing that on a lot of people, and that tells me that these people are the sickest people we've ever cared for. On top of that, we have to give them heavy sedation. We basically put them in a medical coma, and sometimes we have to give them paralysis, so an IV medication dripping into the bloodstream to completely shut down the diaphragm, to completely shut down all the metabolic demand of the body so that oxygen can be utilized. These people are incredibly sick. So that's an outline of the main strategies that we're using currently. 
I'm sure it will change tomorrow, but that's what we're doing right now. I know that you guys aren't in the hospital and you can't see what we're doing. And it's very hard as a loved one to not know what's happening with your person. But please know that on top of all of these medical therapies, we're also investing ourselves into them. We're loving on them. We're praying over them. And we have our fingers crossed every single day that they are going to survive this battle and we fight for them. This is a terrible illness that has affected so many people tragically, but we continue to fight for them every single day that we come to work, friends. So everybody out there, stay safe and I hope I don't have to see you soon.